There's nothing like tuning into an MMA fight on TV or even going in person, but then something freakish happens. Like, I don't know, maybe the entire ring breaks down. <laughs> or what was a win somehow gets overturned. You know, the fight ends in a way it wasn't even remotely imagined to. That's the kind of thing you'll see on today's list, just the weird and crazy stuff. Until the movie just sort of ends. So let's get right into it. I'm Jason from MMA On Point. I want to give a huge shout out to our Hall of Famers who are our biggest supporters for this channel. And with that said, let's jump right into the most ridiculous ways fights have ended in MMA. That is brilliant! Number 10, body weight. Alright, so hearing that title, you might think I'm talking about weight cutting. Uh, no, as crazy as that whole can of worms is, this, in many ways, is its own flavor of bizarre. The year is 1998 and the MMA world is still not quite sure if sumo works in MMA as Conor McGregor would find out eventually. A guy who outweighed him by, I'm gonna guess 40 pounds and had what, five inches of reach on him and got him on the ground. It's called wrestling, sumo style wrestling. So you've got this guy, Emmanuel Yarbrough, who was literally billed at 600 pounds and has at other points in his life weighed as much as 800. 757 pounds of all muscle. You have all muscle. All muscle. Yeah. You are twice the size of the average sumo wrestler. I kind of use my size and my strength as my advantage as a wrestler because um, I hope rest, so. Rest, rest, <laughs> yeah. He infamously fought at UFC 3 against Keith Hackney and Japan was very much interested in bringing him in as an attraction for the Shudo organization. So who was he up against? Well, it was a Japanese pro wrestler by the name of Tatsuo Nakano, who was making his MMA debut and literally weighed under a third of what Yarbrough did at about 190 pounds and literally almost a full foot shorter than Yarbrough at 5'9". This dude Yarbrough was 6'8". So the things you see here are about as wild as David versus Goliath matches can get. And following a bit of silliness of being too far into the ropes, they moved it to the center and... Yeah. Emmanuel Yarbrough straight up got the tap due to laying on him. Pretty much a full on smothering that was just too much for Tatsuo's considerably smaller body to handle and yeah, that was it. Number nine, wardrobe malfunctions. There have been a lot of snafus over the years with fighters attire. Jojo Calderwood and Valeria Letourneau had a really strange issue in their fight. Michael Bisbing actually had an issue with his jock strap against GSP. We, we got a problem here, his cup fell out. It's broken. This Bisping can use a new cup just <laughs> when you think you've seen it all. It's just yeah. sitting in his underwear. That's not good. That That is terrible. And who could forget Big Baby himself, Junior Albini, who kept having problems with his fight shorts to the extent that he literally just started rolling them up, which basically just ended up making him look like a baby in a diaper. You're just sitting there all high and mighty in your diaper. But in the old days, you were allowed to wear a lot more than what is considered your now quote unquote standard fight attire. But long after the UFC had done away with these forms of attire, Japan was more than willing to accommodate whatever a fighter wanted to wear, which did include the traditional martial arts geese. Not really a problem, right? Well, while Vanderlei Silva was in the midst of his incredibly dominant run in Pride, he fought several fighters in a full gi. One of the opponents that did a hybrid of this was a judo expert by the name of Kazuhiro Nakamura, who for some reason sported a short sleeve version and was wearing board shorts. Never seen that before. Anyhow, surprisingly, Nakamura was actually matching Silva's aggression on the feet with an insanely entertaining fight, but the pesky gi had become loose, and it turned away from being just a badge of honor that looked kinda cool into a full-on nuisance, and it was just hanging open. And that's when he made this fatal mistake. You talk about- oh, hey, hey, hey. All right! Oh! He shouldn't have thrown that out! It was bothering him! Not good! Boss Rutten's commentary, man. I miss this dude so much. Right as he threw that jacket and let his guard down, Vanderlei landed that left and it was a beating from then on until the ref finally stopped it. Number eight, a win instantly getting overturned. This is literally an example of when winning ended up actually being worse than losing. Usually when you lose a fight, there's no real shame in a loss. You went out there, you did your best, got to deal with some trolls, sure, 
but you made that walk. Unless you truly did something incredibly embarrassing. Well, in these cases, they pretty much fucked themselves at the last possible moment. Perhaps the most infamous example in recent years was when Drew Chapman was making his pro debut in LFA against Irvin's Ayala, which ended in this really bizarre KO where Ayala actually KO'd himself, falling onto the knee of Chapman. But hey, I guess a win's a win, right? So might as well celebrate. Now, there are a few choices you can make here. Maybe hop on the cage, you can do a backflip, a Chuck Liddell scream or something like that. Well, our guy Drew. Boop, boop. He gets suspended for that. So yeah, he pretty much went from the luckiest dude on the planet where his opponent managed to KO themselves, falling onto his knee, and managed to somehow still lose. This was, of course, an instant disqualification. Pretty much the exact same thing happened when Austin Batra went for the old Brett's Robe double axe handle after KOing Perry Hayer. Why is a really good question to be asking yourself before doing something like this. And then there's the guy who choked out his opponent but wouldn't let him go, then actually tried to square up on Mark Goddard for breaking up the ridiculously long submission. Whoa, 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 what is happening whoa, whoa. here? No, 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 you don't do that. Of course, these are just a few examples. There are shockingly plenty more. Let me know what your favorites are. I'm sure there's plenty I've never seen before. Number seven, too much blood. Is that exactly what it sounds like? Yes, that's exactly what it sounds like. UFC welterweight Nicholas Dalby was in between stints with the UFC, and at the time, he was fighting for Cage Warriors against Ross Houston. The first round was going fairly normally until Houston landed a couple extremely well-placed elbows to the left side of Nicholas Dalby's head that instantly opened him up. Oh, wow. Oh, that's huge. Josh, Josh, Josh. I mean, look, we've got the best cop man in the game. Let's see what they can do. So yeah, as bad as that looked, it was not impairing his vision in any way, something that would definitely get a fight stopped if it was, and he was okay to continue. But as the fight went on, Houston continued to go after that gash, which quickly began to paint the canvas as well as his opponent. The Cutmen tried their best in between rounds, but there was pretty much nothing they could do to stop it. Maybe delay the inevitable. Well, got that there so that the Cutman had actually covered the cut with Vaseline, which one of the older tricks in the book. <laughs> Meanwhile, Houston's nose got busted up and yeah, his nose began leaking as well. So by the end of the second, this was really turning into something out of a slasher movie. Unbelievably, it would make it to the third round as again the official tried to get it all under control. But after it became clear that either man could hardly even stand due to how slippery the cage mat had become, the fight itself had pretty much become a useless exercise with both men falling all over each other and trying to establish some sort of reasonable balance. Again, they literally could not stand up, so Mark Goddard wisely recognized this and called the whole thing off as a no contest. He can, can he get back not able to get back to his feet. Stop, Ross stop, 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 fight's over. St if they've gone the three. <sighs> The fight is over. Not exactly something you see every day. In fact, I definitely have never seen it before or since. Number six, a single leg knockout? This one has become infamous in the MMA community for a lot of reasons, as it was the legendary Sakuraba's first and only UFC appearance. Also, it was the UFC's first foray into the Japanese market, and his opponent was none other than Conan Silvera, who you see absolutely everywhere now as the co-founder and head coach for American Top Team. Gyms don't get much bigger than that, and so you see him in a ton of fighters' corners nowadays. But anyhow, as the two squared off in Japan, what would go down was perhaps one of the most obvious signs MMA was still in its infancy, because after a flurry from Silvera, Big John McCarthy suddenly called off the fight when it looked to him that Sakuraba had just been dropped. The problem was he definitely hadn't been KO'd. In fact, he was diving in on a single leg takedown, an offensive move. Crazy stuff. So what ensued in the following moments was pretty much a full-on tantrum and heavy protest from Sakuraba, and who could blame the guy? He didn't lose that fight, the ref just got it all wrong. Well, it turns out this was all pretty successful. Back then, you didn't have the red tape of athletic commissions, and it didn't take months to get something done. The UFC could just do whatever they wanted. So literally later on that night, they ruled it a no contest on the fly and started from scratch with a new fight between the two again. And this time, it only took about four minutes for Sakuraba to score the armbar win. 
And this definitely isn't the only instance of a referee calling a KO errantly. But it is one of the few times the fighter actually got justice in the end. Sadly, the same can't be said for referee Steve Mazzagatti mistaking an eye poke for a KO, which still counts as a loss on Rumble Johnson's record to this day. Number 5. Vigilante Justice we just looked at pretty much the perfect example of how to deal with a referee's call that you disagree with. Unfortunately for these examples though, well they were pretty much wild instances where the fighter big time overreacted. The classic example is when Gilbert Ivel was competing for a promotion called Fight Festival in Finland against a man named Adi Bachman. I have no idea how you say that, but we'll go with it. What made this one a bit weird is that according to Gilbert Ivel, the ref in this case was not only pulling double duty as the promoter for this event, but on top of that, he was the trainer for Gilbert Ivel's opponent. Wow, talk about a massive conflict of interest. There's actually a really great interview with the Human Animals YouTube channel where he tells the whole story, but essentially he felt the ref was making far too many favorable calls for his opponent, and that caused him to snap. And yeah, to be honest, I would majorly take this story with a huge grain of salt. Was the referee far too invested in this bout to call it evenly? Yeah, he definitely was. He should have never been refing that fight. And furthermore, Ivo was absolutely right to be mad, but holy shit, that's a criminal conviction right there. And the major reason I say it with a grain of salt is Ivo is a notoriously dirty fighter. There are literal compilation videos online of him eye gouging his opponents, which got him DQ'd. Says Gilbert lost. Gilbert lost. Disqualification. Disqualification. Got right. The winner. He bit people. I mean, this dude has always been unhinged. But he's not the only fighter to get DQ'd for going after a referee. The classically most wild fighter probably in MMA history ever was Vyacheslav Datsik, who once attacked a ref in Moscow. I'm not sure why, but he called this fight off after Datsik was taunting and kept acting hurt over and over. I don't know, maybe the ref just felt he didn't have a sound mind, which to be fair is probably true. And this pretty much descended into a full-scale brawl after he and the ref started fighting. <laughs> On to number four, double finishes. Of all the weird endings to fights, this is perhaps the most fun one because it's not like the whole thing fell apart for some screwy reason or weird reason. It's because both guys, yeah, I mean, it's exactly what the title says, they knocked each other out. By far the most famous example happened at LFC 25 in Indianapolis when Tyler Bryan and Sean Parker literally landed a punch on each other at the exact same time. <laughs> UFC vet Shoney Carter was the ref and his reaction pretty much says it all. This has happened a bunch since then, but it's definitely the most famous one to this day. Another example of a double finish wasn't a double KO with Matt Hughes and Carlos Newton, but Hughes basically KO'd Newton with a slam as he fell unconscious from a triangle, which is just insane to think about. Perhaps the wildest one is when Alexander Emelianenko recently basically got finished on the feet, but just as the ref appears to stop it, his opponent helped him back up, and then the guy got subbed on a takedown attempt just a couple moments later. I mean, it's gotta be some sort of bizarre fight fixing gone wrong, as his opponent clearly didn't mean to win and gave up the easiest Kimura I've probably ever seen. Either way, it's basically a double finish with the fight somehow ending twice for both sides. Number three, cage slash equipment failures. Some of the craziest endings to a fight by far are when, well, the cage or ring itself makes things impossible to go on. A really famous example of this is when Rich Franklin fought Aaron Brink in IFC and somehow Brink's foot literally got wedged in between the mat and cage. Apparently it messed up his leg bad enough to where he couldn't continue the fight, so that was a no contest, but it is kind of hilarious to hear the commentary realize this in real time. I think this... I don't know what's going on. Stronger. Brink's is motioning to the referee and they're stopping the act. I'm not Stuck sure. Stuck in the cage. He's actually fallen between He's the edge of the cage the oh. and the floor there. <laughs> I've never seen that. I've, I've seen people fall out of rings, but this is a cage. We're not supposed to do that. Another time really similar to this that's often forgot about actually occurred in the UFC between Jorge Masvidal and Jake Ellenberger when his toes got caught in the fence somehow. And knowingly, the fight wasn't just restarted, but instead called a TKO. 
Not really sure why this was Ellenberger's fault. Another wild cage malfunction is seeing a takedown attempt just bust straight through the cage door. This has happened a few times actually, but what stands out to me was the time Joe Lozon captured it happening at Cage Titans 27 back in 2016. Yeah, that fight was instantly over. The most wild instance of these malfunctions was actually in a ring back in 2008, when future UFC heavyweights Blagoj Ivanov and Alir Latifi fought for Real Pain Challenge. This was in Bulgaria. But only about a minute into the fight, this craziness happened. As the tape rolls on, you realize it's not just the ropes that fell, but the entire corner post as well. It's hard to find a ton of info on this event, but from what I can tell off their record on SureDog, this was only the fourth fight into the card. And yeah, most cards on the regional scene are going to have at least 10 fights or more. So I can't be for sure, but from the looks of it, they couldn't figure it out in time and just had to cancel the entire event. So yeah, a no contest for both men. Number two, self finishes. It's hard to find something more embarrassing than this, to be quite honest. Just like Tyson Fury hitting himself in boxing when he still had a full head of hair. Um, I couldn't really feel the other guy's punches, so I decided to punch my own self in the face. MMA fighters too have done similar things. Things. Sadly, for these fighters, there are so many examples of this. Uh, fighters basically spiking themselves on their own takedowns, like with Gray Maynard or Mark Kerr. Other people going for flying kicks that wildly backfired. It's super rare to catch it happening live, but over 30 years or so of the sport being formalized around the world, it definitely has happened enough times. And his forehead hit the ground. Good move by Kevin McDonald. He to didn't get stick his own hand out quick enough to stop his momentum and his face, face from plan. bouncing off the... The craziest one as of late, though, it's not a KO, but actually a submission. Yes, that is apparently possible. It looks like while attacking his opponent's legs, Luis Claudio somehow tied up his own to where he was somehow putting a ton of crazy pressure on what looks like his left knee. At least that's the one the doctors are focusing on after the fight, so it must have been that knee. It's kind of hard to tell. It's really a strange entanglement that I wasn't even aware was possible to somehow do. By the way, our own Max Rendell, who usually does editing for us in The Unfamiliars, has done an amazing breakdown of this on his channel, Combat Arcade, if you guys want to check out all the nuances of this one. Absolutely insane. Oh, and as a quick bonus, you've got this really strange finish with Ari Gelli and Hongman Choi. I don't even know what knocked him out, but I don't know, maybe he hit his head on the back of the cage? You guys tell me. And then number one, quitters. Few things are perhaps more regrettable than instead of choosing to leave it all out there is to well just straight up quit. And of course, I'm not talking about tapping or succumbing to injuries, which would mean you definitely should be quitting. A bizarre example of this was when Ken Shamrock quit in pride against Kazuyuki Fujita because he thought he was having a heart attack, which instead appeared to be heart palpitations. The going theory is that it was due to intense anxiety he was facing throughout his then divorce and increased family roles, which then led to a lack of preparation going to the fight and he was just kind of freaking out. This was a fight he was winning, by the way. It wasn't like he was quitting to get out of it. But then there are plenty of instances of people quitting for that very reason. Mark Kerr in his prime had a couple of guys just straight up quit on him. Hugo Duarte kept making really strange and bizarre noises like he was shouting at somebody in the ring. We're trying to explode a little bit there. Well, I don't know what that's about. <laughs> What was that? How oh, therefore are they going to have promoters pay them to, to fight? And then stalled out to such a degree that the ref recognized he was basically quitting without saying it as he started to try to escape the ring. Look, he grabbed this. Look at this. Look at this. He's trying to escape. The fight's over. This also happened in Brazil with IBC as a dude literally named Maestro Hulk. Wait, what? Master Hulky, 34 year old policeman. Yeah, a dude was named Master Hulk literally hopped out of the ring mid beating. Hulk backing out of the ring. Back that that should should be be it. It. Then there's UFC vet Matt Sarah's little bro Nick Sarah basically doing the same thing as Hugo Duarte when he refused to get up off the mat. Although in his case, it was definitely due to insane exhaustion rather than outright fear. But yeah, I've basically done a full list on this as well and would recommend that if you guys want to hear in-depth stories about all these guys and more and why they suddenly quit mid-fight. But anyhow, that's it for me, guys. I hope you all enjoyed that at least as much as I did writing and editing it. It's just crazy to learn about this stuff and talk about it. MMA is just an insane sport. Maybe one day we'll get our own parachute incident like boxing has. I do want to 
give a special shout out to our champions and Hall of Famers. If you are interested in our exclusive live streams and bonus content, we are reducing our prices by almost half as we're combining the two tiers. So consider becoming a Hall of Famer for that bonus content and supporting the channel by clicking the link in the description. But yeah, anybody who watches it all, I'm really thankful for you guys in general. Have a great day and I'll catch you on the next one. Peace.